Gentlemen, this next story is about love, betrayal, and adultery. This story is completely fictional and never happened in reality. But sometimes real life can be so much cooler than fictional stories. Let's listen to it and maybe this story will be a cautionary lesson for someone. I expected a more elegant demeanor from a woman who teaches creative writing at a nearby community college. The room was in semi-darkness, so it was difficult to distinguish Sally's presence when she occupied my favorite chair. Her legs were folded, hidden under a cozy blanket. As I got closer I noticed her disheveled hair, smudged makeup, and the overpowering stench of vomit coming from her. Let me describe the scene and you can fix all the mistakes. My wife started to object, but I sternly ordered her to be silent. I'll let you know when you're allowed to speak, I said aggressively, sitting over her and beginning my speech. In the process of passing through customs, along with my team, a duo of formally dressed gentlemen with badges approached me and demanded my presence. They immediately introduced themselves as detectives from the Chicago Police Department and escorted me to an interrogation room run by the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Accompanying me, the senior detective imperceptibly followed their example and closed the door behind us. In this sparsely furnished room with a single chair, he began, I wanted to know about your whereabouts at noon today. Peeking through the curtains, I saw a junior agent who was interviewing my team. I gave him a puzzled look, as if he had said something stupid. It dawned on me that he might not know that I was an airplane captain who had just arrived from Paris, France, and not from the suburbs of Joliet. Considering the fact that I crossed several time zones during today's flight, I assumed he was referring to the local time in Chicago. In that case, I had to fly a Boeing 747. At an altitude of 35,000 feet, soaring over the vast expanses of the Atlantic Ocean, our plane developed an impressive speed. If you need confirmation, I can provide you with my logbook. With the utmost confidence, I took out my briefcase and handed it to him, although he did not bother to look at its contents. Not calming down, I continued to explain. By the way, my crew consisted of 14 qualified specialists, and I enjoyed the trust of 416 passengers who are ready to vouch for me. Thus, I found myself at a loss. Suddenly, a younger agent came on the scene and proclaimed, Everyone unanimously confirms that he really was flying the plane. Their attitude to what was happening changed surprisingly quickly, as soon as they realized the extent of their stupidity. Unfortunately, Captain, I apologize for the inconvenience, but we are currently conducting a murder investigation. Murders, you say? No one died on my plane, I replied fervently. No, sir, it happened today. Considering that I have been in Europe for the last few days, I believe I have a reliable alibi. Yes, sir. So, who is accusing me of taking someone's life? This is your wife, sir. What? I cried out in shock. I couldn't believe it. The authenticity of my reaction was undeniable. All that was required of my friend Angelo was to teach this bastard a lesson, beat him up well, maybe even break his nose and jaw. But I didn't want anyone to die. My wife's words echoed in my head. Who did she accuse of murder? This must be some kind of twisted joke, right? Unfortunately, it wasn't a joke at all. Shocked and deeply regretting that he had brought bad news, he informed me that my wife had claimed that I had taken her lover's life. I instantly jumped up from my chair, rage blazed in my eyes. A lover? Did he just say lover? I demanded, but he adamantly stood his ground. Yes, sir, this is not a laughing matter. My wife is faithful. I completely trust my wife, and the idea that she is cheating on me never occurs to me. It looks like you mistook me for someone else. I'm sorry, Captain, but your wife specifically mentioned that you were the one who committed the act of cruelty by beating someone to death with a baseball bat in your driveway. This is puzzling because at that moment I was on the plane. She was well aware of my presence in France. How can this be explained? I'm sorry, but she mentioned that you changed your travel plans after learning about her affair. Please refrain from making such statements, I exclaimed. My wife is absolutely not involved in any affairs. 
I fully believed in her loyalty to our wedding vows. She would never betray them. When I looked at the detective, there was a blank look in their eyes, perhaps hardened by watching countless deaths that had robbed them of their ability to empathize. Overwhelmed with emotion, I sank into a chair and began to sob uncontrollably. But it seems that my wife was the victim of a skillful manipulator, someone who preyed on women whose husbands often went on business trips. Although this is of little comfort, three more cuckold husbands are waiting for interrogation. These words were uttered in a detached, cold tone, in which there was not the slightest hint of emotion. I felt excruciating pain, as if my heart was being forcefully torn out of my chest. I rolled over on my back in unbearable agony. In the midst of my suffering, one of the detectives offered me comfort by placing a comforting hand on my shoulder. Captain, is there anyone I can contact? What is it? He asked kindly. Driven by a mixture of anger and despair, I clenched my fists into fists. I want to talk to my unfaithful wife, I replied, my voice trembling with excitement. But the detective advised against it, suggesting that it would be wiser to wait until I calmed down. Realizing the gravity of the situation, the senior detective exchanged a few words with his partner in a quiet tone, after which he briefly left the room. When he returned, he apologized and informed them that they had to leave. Desperate to get answers before they left, I asked, Wait, before you leave, could you at least tell me who it was? The experienced detective took a battered notebook out of his coat pocket and skimmed through its pages. Michael Wakeman, 30 years old. Coincidentally, he is the same age as our son. Before I continue, may I ask about the circumstances of his death? Has he come to a quick end, or has he endured a long ordeal? A sinister grin appeared on his face as he recounted the incident. Apparently, the attacker lured him outside, set fire to his newly purchased Corvette convertible. Wakeman, dressed only in his underwear, rushed out through a side door. The first blow with a baseball bat hit him right in the chest. As a result of the next blow, he suffered a serious back injury. Then the attacker forcibly turned him over and mercilessly kicked him in the groin. A moment before the explosion of the car, he was fatally struck on the skull. Paramedics who arrived at the scene found that he was in terrible agony. Blood was flowing from his ears and mouth. Despite their efforts, his condition deteriorated rapidly and eventually his heart stopped working. Obviously, his end was not peaceful. I tried to hide my smile. But I must inform you that your wife may not be present when you return home. The house was severely damaged when Wakeman's car suddenly exploded. The force of the explosion shattered all the windows on this side, and the subsequent fire left visible traces of destruction. At that moment, I was overwhelmed by a mixture of emotions, some part of me almost screamed with relief, but I instinctively covered my face with trembling hands and again succumbed to uncontrollable sobs. The harsh reality of the situation struck me to the core, and I found myself paralyzed in this room, unable to make a single movement. It was only when a representative of the Immigration and Naturalization Service unexpectedly knocked on the door, urgently demanding a room, that I came out of my stupor. Gathering all the remaining strength in me, I somehow managed to find my car among the chaos and remains and began a melancholic journey home. And now I'm asking you, what do you think about all this? What seems different from reality? In a quiet suburb west of Chicago in the late 60s of the last century, viewers were captivated by the popular television series Bewitched. Among his eccentric characters was Gladys Kravitz, a curious local resident who was often caught peeking through the curtains at the Stevens house. In my own neighborhood, Angelo D'Agostino, an elderly widower who lives right across from my house, plays a similar role. Last fall, Angelo, who lost his beloved wife of 52 years, has since devoted his time to watching the comings and goings of other people. On days with good weather, he would sit on the porch, warmly greeting people passing by. In inclement weather, he sat at the window of his house and waved affably to everyone who caught his eye. 
When July 15th appeared on the calendar, a day blessed with impeccable weather, Angelo did not lose his vigilance, dressed in an old shirt, black shorts and black knee-length socks, although many, including his late wife, might find his commitment unusual. Because of his repulsive behavior, I shunned him like a contagious disease. Fortunately, while I was often away on long business trips, Angelo kindly looked after my house. Every time I returned home, he was looking forward to my arrival, sharing the latest gossip from the life of the neighbors. As a sign of appreciation, I often gave him small, inexpensive gifts that I picked up during my travels, and he kindly accepted them. This time, when I arrived at my entrance, Angelo got to his feet and waved at me in a friendly way. Noticing his desire to indulge in gossip, I decided to leave the bags in the trunk and cheerfully crossed the street. It was a surprise to hear about your friend's magnificent Corvette, but I couldn't help but wonder who this friend was who just the other day parked at our entrance. It's strange that you didn't say anything about it, especially since she invited him into the house. This mysterious friend arrived precisely at noon and stayed with you for exactly three hours. Could you give a description of this intriguing man? He turned out to be very handsome and resembled a typical playboy in fashionable mirrored sunglasses and impeccable attire. Dressed in khaki trousers and a polo shirt, I was wondering who was wearing these clothes. Thoughts were spinning in my head that maybe one of my fellow pilots decided to make me jealous. But who could it be? And why is this man staying here so long? Driven by curiosity, I wondered why you didn't disclose any information about this during our conversation. Perhaps the mysterious man wanted to surprise me with a fiberglass toy, urging you to keep it a secret. When I was unpacking in our bedroom, you came back with your shopping and rushed up the stairs to hug me with such force that I almost lost my balance. How is my beloved? To say that the greeting I received was unusually affectionate is a gross understatement. In the blink of an eye, we plunged into passion completely ignoring the painful thoughts about mysterious cars. The following days were filled with bliss, as if we were newlyweds. You embodied the perfect combination of a devoted wife and a passionate lover. During our dinners, you confidently wore one of the outfits I bought, despite the fact that I teased you about being unsuitable for a woman your age. To my pleasant surprise, I found that you even wore nylon stockings and garters, which were not there when you got out of the car. When I went to work the following Wednesday, my wishes were fully fulfilled and I was satisfied. To my delight, you even put a sweet romantic message in my suitcase. During this trip, I was filled with boundless joy and I was looking forward to returning home. But to my chagrin, Angelo unexpectedly delivered another depressing blow. He informed me that your friend with the Corvette paid another visit yesterday. Curiosity got the better of me, and I began to pry details out of him. Grinning, he noticed that this man was younger than me. According to my estimates, he was about 30. He exuded an air of smartness, and he showed amazing punctuality. Arriving at noon sharp, he stayed until 3 o'clock. I began to think about the identity of this mysterious visitor. Just as I was unpacking, you came home again. Coming down the stairs, I was greeted with affectionate bear hugs, followed by a passionate kiss. When I pulled out of my embrace to catch my breath, you excitedly informed me that you had found a recipe in a magazine and were going to cook a culinary masterpiece for me. You bought some expensive steaks, intending to treat me to a hearty lunch, but you had to go to the grocery store quickly to get the latest ingredients. You just sit back and relax and I'll do the cooking, you purred, handing me a beer. Warning signs immediately flashed in my head and sirens wailed. In all the 30 years of our marriage, my wife never brought me a beer or offered to relax after returning from a trip. You always prepared a list of tasks for me before I even had time to take off my uniform. A small voice in my head suggested that you might be feeling guilty. Trying to cheer myself up, I took up the investigation. As soon as you left, I hurried outside and started rummaging through the trash cans, hoping to find something amiss. Not knowing what to look for, maybe empty packages of used contraceptives, I found only typical household waste. 
Back in our room I carefully examined the contents of your underwear drawer. It is important to note that you have always been faithful and have never given me any reason to doubt. I felt guilty rummaging through your underwear but I didn't find anything significant. The contents of the bedside table remained unchanged, filled with the same unremarkable objects that had been lying there for years. Curiosity made me open the laundry basket in the bathroom, but I found it completely empty. This caught my attention, especially considering that the bed linen was recently washed. It seemed strange to me, because I clearly remembered that it had been changed the morning I left. But clean sheets alone weren't enough to stand up to you. I devoted a few minutes to studying all your shoeboxes, realizing that you have an extensive collection, but my efforts were fruitless. I rummaged through your closet, but I didn't find anything unusual. Everything seemed normal. But my investigation was interrupted by the sound of the door opening. Where's my driver? You exclaimed. Having decided to wait until morning, I was hoping that you would tell Sally about her mysterious visitor. Of course, there must be a logical explanation for this. I was relieved, because that evening you demonstrated your captivating attractiveness. During breakfast, I tried to make a couple of unexpected remarks without seeming discourteous. But you've never put yourself in an awkward situation. I had a feeling of anxiety in my stomach. After lunch, you mentioned that you need to go to the store to buy something for dinner. I politely declined your offer to accompany you as I longed to be alone at home. As soon as you left, I immediately resumed my search for any hints and clues, starting with the laundry room. Inside, I found two neatly arranged baskets. One contained clothes and the other was filled with our bedding. It struck me that for the second week in a row, all possible evidence was carefully erased and cleaned. To prevent this from happening again, I needed to find a solution to turn off the washing machine. Taking a proactive approach, I developed a plan. You've been persistently trying to persuade me to take you to Paris with me ever since the airline opened flights to this city. But since it was a new destination, I didn't have a regular flight to Paris. But I managed to negotiate with another pilot and get a ticket. After talking about Angelo's upcoming journey, he was delighted and began to talk about his experience of liberating the enchanting City of Lights. It was during our conversation that I discovered Angelo's weakness his addiction to Chateau de Montifaud Cognac. While serving in France during World War II, he developed an addiction that remained with him. But due to the restrictions associated with their social security checks, he could only afford the domestic variety of his preferred indulgence from the nearest large liquor store. When we sat down to dinner that evening, I could no longer contain my excitement. I told you that I changed my travel plans by rerouting my next flight from Frankfurt to Paris, and invited her to join me on this spontaneous adventure. I promised her an unforgettable day of shopping on the famous Champs-Élysées, followed by a wonderful dinner at the respected Jules Verne restaurant, located at the top of the legendary Eiffel Tower. After unsuccessfully offering to take a romantic cruise on the Seine River by moonlight, you resolutely refused my invitation. I was curious, and I asked why you didn't want to fly. In response, you grunted vaguely and muttered something about your overloaded schedule. Having decided to look into the reasons, I begged you to change your mind, and asked what could be so urgent that it could not be postponed. But you pointedly suggested that maybe we would go on this adventure another time. The state of our marriage became increasingly strained, and in the days that followed, it seemed to me that I just existed trapped in a zombie state. Just the sight of you gave me a bitter taste, and I couldn't communicate with you without feeling a surge of indignation. I rejected your advances throughout the night, and you persistently asked me what was bothering me. But in the morning, as the time of the trip approached, I made another attempt to convince you to share a romantic trip to Paris. Gently putting my hands on your shoulders, I closed your eyes and begged, please choose me. But again, you flatly refused. Although I had strong suspicions, I refrained from voicing them, realizing that I lacked concrete evidence. That's why I kept silent. Before I left, I decided to disrupt your laundry plans by cutting the cold water hose for the washing machine. Although it wasn't a difficult task, 
it was enough to discourage you from doing laundry. As a result, water started splashing on the wall when you tried to use the car. Fortunately, the floor in the laundry room had a slope leading to the drain, which allowed the rising water to drain down. I closed the door and was relieved to see that the water was not seeping under the wall, and you can only notice the flooding when you visit the laundry room. On the way to the airport, I was preoccupied with my own thoughts. I felt a sense of anxiety, worried about my ability to maintain concentration while flying the plane. The burden of responsibility weighed on me because I knew that the lives of hundreds of people were entrusted to my skills. I made a conscious effort to distract myself and focus only on fulfilling my duties. When we took off, my co-pilot felt that something was wrong. Realizing that it was hard for me, he kindly offered me to take control of the plane. In response, I explained my condition by a sudden illness and asked for an early break. Sneaking into the rest area at the back of the plane, I couldn't help but feel an overwhelming inner turmoil. For the next hour, I struggled with my thoughts and emotions tearing myself apart. Upon arrival, I expressed regret about my illness and announced my intention to limit myself to bed for the entire duration of our stay. Angelo immediately informed me that a visitor was expected at noon sharp. Sensing an opportunity, I decided to take a chance. Being interested in keeping a strict schedule, Angelo dialed his home phone at exactly 12.02, fervently hoping that you would either answer the call or listen to my pre-recorded message. Fortunately, my message sounded after the second ring, obediently captured by the answering machine. The voice quickly informed, You've called the Rockwell house. Please leave a message and we will respond promptly. Sally, my dear, I am in the most charming city on earth, but without you, everything makes no sense. Unfortunately, my sentence was cut short as the recording was abruptly interrupted. Determined, I dialed zero to get through to the outside line carefully entered the country and city codes, and then our home phone number. The phone rang insistently, indicating that someone had turned off the answering machine. I could only hope that when you heard my voice you would end your date. I stayed true to my promise and did not leave the room during the entire waiting time. Having settled into the cockpit of the plane, I finally accepted that my marriage ended unsuccessfully. When I returned home, there was an unexpected change. She was really there. But she looked disheveled, like a soaked rat. Without any greetings, she immediately began to talk loudly about the chaos that the flooded basement had caused and that everything below was destroyed. When I offered to assess the damage after I changed into my uniform, she was visibly upset. I must admit, I was intrigued by the refusal of the water to drain. I quickly changed into cut-off jeans and a t-shirt and went to the garage to get my shoes. As soon as I entered, my attention was immediately attracted by the laundry basket on the table. In it, I noticed neatly laid out sheets and a pair of Sally's panties lying on the surface. I slipped them into my pocket. Watching the water gushing violently from the copper faucet, I asked Sally why she decided to disconnect the hose instead of just closing the faucet. Her response was somewhat incoherent. I found the drain and removed the rags that were interfering with it, which caused a swirl in the water. Releasing a sigh of relief, I saw that the water level was gradually decreasing. Having instructed Sally to go upstairs and make coffee, I took the opportunity to examine the gusset of the extracted panties. Unfortunately, it turned out that they were covered with unpleasant dried spots. Although I felt a surge of disappointment, I managed to keep my composure long enough to inspect the bedding. I noticed a noticeable spot in the very center, which made me imperceptibly move the laundry basket to a less noticeable place. As I made my way through the damp room, thoughts of the upcoming confrontation flashed through my head. I took out a large plastic garbage bag and quickly started filling it with various items. Ten minutes later, I dragged the trash bag onto the sidewalk. At that moment, Angelo motioned for me to approach him. Come inside, he said, making it clear that we needed to talk. Surprisingly, this was the first time he invited me to his house. He invited me to sit down and addressed me as the captain. 
a nickname he had given me since birth. I've known you since the day you were born, he said. Your parents held a special place in my heart, even more than most members of my own family. He clenched his fists tightly. It's not easy for me to tell you this news, but your wife was unfaithful. When I saw a man in a red Corvette drive up yesterday, I crossed the street and looked through your living room window. I'm very sorry to inform you, but they were locked in a passionate embrace, undressing each other. I watched them until they disappeared upstairs. My worst fears have been confirmed. It really hurts me to watch how she showed you such disrespect. My dear friend, I will try to convey this with the utmost delicacy. Such betrayal will have consequences. I have connections with a group of people who operate outside the law. Some members of this group owe me money on our past business ventures. My dear friend, if you give your word, this despicable man will never bother your wife again. I solemnly swear by the welfare of my grandchildren that she will remain unharmed, but will understand the severity of her actions. I mumbled a reply and expressed my gratitude, but regretfully informed him that it was too late. Angelo squeezed my hands tightly and assured me, there's still time to stop her from hurting you again. I looked at him and nodded in agreement. Then we had a short conversation about how to change my schedule so that I would not be present at the execution of justice. A whirlwind of thoughts raced through my head as I hurried back home. Later in the evening, it dawned on me that the bottle of cognac I had bought earlier had remained untouched in my car. Overwhelmed by the anticipation of our previous conversation, I couldn't help but wonder if Angelo's words were truly sincere. Leaving the box on the porch of Angelo's house, I quickly rang his doorbell and hurriedly retreated to avoid further clashes. When I approached my house, the darkness of the night enveloped me. But turning the last corner, my path was suddenly interrupted. The road was blocked by a police car, which made traffic difficult. An officer came up to me and politely informed me, Excuse me, sir. Only local residents are allowed past this place. Reacting quickly, I took out my wallet and handed the officer my driver's license. When he looked at the address and then at my name, the sudden change in his expression showed a mixture of awkwardness and embarrassment. I'm sorry, Mr. Rockwell. While driving, I couldn't help but notice people standing on their lawns, pointing and waving at me as I drove by. I noticed several large TV company trucks on the street, and unfortunately, the charred remains of a Corvette were lying in my driveway, which caused me to park a few houses away. As I approached the scene, one of the reporters quickly noticed my uniform, instantly turning his attention to me. Numerous questions were being asked in my direction, and one persistent voice was constantly asking, Did you commit the crime? As I raised my hand to speak, a sudden flash of light temporarily blinded me. Just a few hours ago, the Chicago Police Department broke the shocking news that my wife was involved in an affair and her lover tragically died in our own driveway. But it is important to note that this incident occurred during my flight over the vast Atlantic Ocean. Therefore, I could not be the culprit of his death. Still, I couldn't help but express my gratitude to the one who took the trouble to rid society of such a disgusting person. I rehearsed this phrase countless times on the way home, hoping that I would finally get the opportunity to say it. To my relief, the policeman shouted, allowing me to pass. After expressing my gratitude, I headed across the courtyard, pausing for a moment to assess the extent of the destruction. I saw this as a potential opportunity to take an amazing photo. The devastating consequences were obvious, broken windows and a charred garage. But thanks to the durability of the strong brick walls, the fire did not penetrate into the house. When I entered the house, Sally, visibly exhausted and disheveled, was wiping her face with her sleeve. Her appearance was far from perfect. Circumstances had taken an unexpected turn. It seemed unthinkable that everything had turned out that way. I screamed, believing that you and I were destined to be together against all odds. Falling to her knees with tears in her eyes, she destroyed our bond. Our family. 
Our common existence has turned into ruins because of your actions. Everything that was dear to us has been destroyed. And Sally remained silent. She was still unresponsive to the silence, and her labored breathing echoed through the room, like an asthmatic desperately trying to relieve his condition. Why, why, why? I instinctively covered my exhausted face with my hands, trying to regain my composure. Sally's voice trembled with remorse, and a stream of apologies poured out of her as she confessed her love. I can't understand it, because you are the only man who has ever owned my heart. I deeply apologize for the pain I caused you. I wanted to hurt her the same way my wife hurt me. It was obvious that you knew about your lover's marital status and that his wife was expecting a child. The thought of their child growing up without a father because of your actions is truly devastating. At that moment, she expressed her suffering by exclaiming, God, no! It's clear that you knew that you weren't the only one he was involved with. The detective said that there are several other husbands who are potential suspects. To him, you were just another one he was unfaithful to. The sound of sadness that escaped her was unlike anything I had ever heard from anyone. Honestly, I had every intention of ending my relationship with him. Today should have marked the denouement, but it became a source of great guilt since I refused to go to Paris. I answered her harshly, telling her to stop spreading lies. Do you feel guilty just because you missed Paris? The guilt should have stemmed from your infidelity. When did you plan to end the relationship? After a night of bliss. I know that the authorities found him in a compromising state, so there is no need to deceive me. Sally began to express regret and beg for forgiveness. Please find the strength in your heart to forgive me. In the midst of all this, an unusual thought occurred to me, which caused fun. If you really regretted canceling our trip to Paris, you would have ended our relationship before you let this man into our house for a last meeting. Thus, his unfortunate fate would unfold in another person's house, leaving you out of suspicion and me in the dark about your infidelity. I can't help but wonder, insidious, how many other individuals did you have an affair with during our marriage, avoiding any consequences? I sincerely swear that he was the only participant in this affair, I swear, I swear to God. For what reason should I trust you? Sally's stomach clenched and she shuddered as if she might vomit. Paradoxically, my mother judged you quite correctly. She despised you as soon as she saw you. Can you remember that day? It was three months after graduation, and you came to tell me that your period was gone. Mom was sure that you did it on purpose to lure me into a trap. Despite her contempt for you, she still offered you shelter under her roof. It is impossible to put into words how many times she quietly handed me a small amount of money, knowing full well about my empty bank account. She always made me promise to keep it a secret that she was covering the cost of our child's meals. Moreover, when I made my career as a pilot working on night flights, she diligently took care of our son, allowing you to go to college. I was determined to refute my mother's erroneous beliefs. I'm tired of her treating you badly, constantly giving preference to my brother's wives. And yet I always defended you, because we were a united front, an inseparable team. I saw a newfound sense of pride in you, and it was truly wonderful. This is the first time I've seen her genuinely proud of your achievements. Looking back, I am grateful to her that she did not have to witness the devastating fall that eventually engulfed us. Sally's anguished cry echoed in the heavens. Oh my God, for what? You know that my father died when I was only 12 years old. Reflecting on my teenage years, I remembered one moment when curiosity got the better of me. I asked my mom why she still wears wedding rings. And without giving her a chance to answer, I impulsively shouted out words that only an ignorant teenager could utter. Mom, you don't look that old. You should go on a date. Smiling, she wrapped her arms around my arms and said softly, I cannot fulfill this request because I am married. We took a solemn oath before God, our loved ones and friends to put each other above all else. Although your father is no longer with us, nothing has changed. He lives in my heart as deeply as he did when he lived under our roof. And one day, we will be reunited. 
Embarrassed, I confessed my incomprehensibility. She smiled, assuring me that she would pray for my understanding in due course. It took me a long time to mature and truly realize the depth of their love and unwavering devotion to each other even after death. I've never admitted this to you, but on my first flight, the flight attendant offered me a drink together during the transfer. This stewardess was extremely beautiful, and for a moment I was seduced by this offer. But in that fleeting moment, I remembered my mother, proudly showed off my wedding ring and resolutely refused, saying that I could not participate because I was married. I cannot stress enough how often I have refused such offers. Word of my alleged insanity spread quickly, and to my surprise I took it as a sign of pride. A deep sigh escaped my lips as I thought about the flawless love my parents shared. I once believed that we were on the way to achieving the same bliss, but your actions have destroyed our harmony, leaving me with nothing but boiling hatred for you. Amid the tears, Sally managed to pull herself together and begged, Please, I will do whatever it takes to make amends. Anything? I replied mockingly. Then go back to the past, to the moment when this womanizer began his relentless seduction. I would appreciate it if you could change the course of events. I ask you to politely inform him that you are happily married and not interested in him. It would be great if you mentioned that your spouse has a great job and treats you with great respect. Please invite him to return home to his pregnant wife. And finally, if he tries to approach you again, it would be helpful if you let him know that your husband will figure out the situation. Could you help me with this? Sally, overwhelmed with emotion, fell to her knees and sobbed. She shook her head sadly. I'm not sure I can fulfill this request. Please forgive me. No, but I need to leave. I do not know where to go. I need to get away from you, I thought desperately. Sally suddenly took a sharp step towards me, clutching my ankle. No, please, she begged, her voice filled with despair. Just let me go, or I swear I'll break your arm. Sensing an opportunity, she loosened her grip slightly, giving me a chance to break free. Without thinking, I quickly turned around and headed for the exit. As soon as the door swung open, Sally let out a high-pitched scream. I wish he'd destroyed me too, she exclaimed, as if she'd read my mind. Since then I've seen Sally once, during the divorce proceedings. I have settled in the beautiful city of Paris and am happily living a bachelor life. Apparently the death of her lover affected Sally very badly, or our divorce, her psyche was undermined, and now she is being treated in a psychiatric hospital. Besides, after the divorce I left her without means of subsistence, and rumors about her infidelity and the death of her lover spread around the neighborhood. Everyone recognized Sally as a promiscuous cheating wife. I had a lurking suspicion about my second wife, something I couldn't figure out. You know that disturbing feeling when everything seems wrong but you can't pinpoint the cause. It always seemed to me that this is a subconscious mechanism, when our brain collects and evaluates fragments of information until it discovers a pattern that prompts us to admit that something is wrong. These phenomena are actively discussed by researchers, who often cite premonitions and female intuition as vivid examples. It is worth noting that I was lucky enough to raise four children with my first wife. I was lucky to be supported by kind-hearted people who achieved success in their careers and created strong families. They played an important role in my life, offering their help when I needed it. When we faced the tragic loss of our mother, we clung to each other, finding solace in our shared experiences and becoming even closer. By the time I married Ellen, my siblings had already started their own families or had graduated from college. Despite the age difference of almost 11 years, Ellen and I seemed to complement each other perfectly. We had common values, aspirations, and our physical connection was undeniable. Although she may not have met the generally accepted standards of beauty in society, at 5 feet 5 inches tall, she possessed captivating attractiveness. She had an impeccable physique. Her eyes, which resembled a smoky shade, were of such a deep brown color that they seemed almost black. A magnificent mane of brown hair cascaded along her, gracefully falling to her shoulders. 
She devoted herself to intense training, striving for perfection, and basked in the rays of compliments. Although my children tried to coexist with her, they never managed to establish a close bond. But as adults, they didn't feel hostility towards her if they didn't feel affection. Their contentment depended only on my happiness, and as long as I was happy, they were happy too. After six years of marriage, I began to have an uneasy feeling. At 55, I couldn't ignore the nagging feeling that something was wrong. My wife, who was 46 years old, was caught in a series of inconsequential deceptions, which combined to form an alarming picture. The growing anxiety became too strong and forced me to turn to my old daughter for comfort. Melody, a woman of about 35 years old, had undeniable attractiveness. She had a husband who worked as an accountant, and two daughters who adored their grandfather. Interestingly, Melody herself studied accounting calmness. The truth is often hidden behind appearances, and this haunted her and contributed to their financial prosperity. Mel was the proud owner of one of the most prosperous private detective agencies in the Southeast region. With impressive qualifications in computer science and psychology, she had a natural ability to recognize lies, easily analyzing body language and voice signals. It was not an easy task to surprise her. Running five offices, Mel hired an equal number of people with technical expertise and experienced retired police officers, which was one of the smartest strategies among her many tactics. It's hard to get people's attention these days, especially if you're a young geek with a laptop or even just a grandmother going for a morning walk. Unfortunately, this is reflected in the state of her bank account. Wanting to help her, I decided to give her some money to start her own business. The funds came from the insurance I received after her mother's death. Although she made several attempts to repay me, she eventually gave up when I gave her a harsh ultimatum. If she did not repay me, I would no longer attend family meetings with her. Surprisingly, she didn't look overwhelmed by my threat. There were no empty assurances on her part like, maybe it's okay, or maybe it's just your imagination. I'm happy to investigate this case, it's pretty simple. For two weeks, she constantly asked me to be present in her office when I went home. Coincidentally, my office was in the city center, right next to hers. Unfortunately, I had a reputation as an unimportant consultant, the kind of person you hire to tell you what you already knew about saving your company. It was depressing to me that a significant part of my job was saying the obvious, just to satisfy the exorbitant fees they paid me. Sometimes I was assigned to be the bearer of bad news, a role I despised, but most of the people I had to fire were worthy of being fired, and I understood that perfectly well. On the other hand, some were completely stunned by this decision. When I entered the room, my daughter threw the folder on the table. He turned out to be our neighbor, a married man of 34 years old with two children. He was unemployed and spent his days doing various activities with my wife to relieve stress while his wife worked and the children went to school. There were photos of him and my wife together on my couch, on the washing machine, on our dining table, on his chair, and even in his own backyard. The photo captured the moment when he was kneeling in front of a children's swing, and my beloved wife was sitting on them, fascinated by the rhythmic movement. He seemed to despise beds. Mel, watching me closely, understood me well enough to warn me against rash decisions. Don't do anything stupid, Dad, she advised, urging me to end the relationship and move on. Assuring me that she inherited a shrewd mind from me, she stressed that the prenup protects me from any potential harm. Despite her advice, I realized that it was too late, but I still appreciated her instructions. Meeting my gaze, she reached for the phone and said she was going to call Junior. In any case, he should be aware since he is your legal advisor. Perhaps he can talk you out of further plans. In this regard, I want to mention my eldest son's studies. Mel sent me some photos and I've already started filing the necessary paperwork. It's very important that you stay calm and let me deal with this situation. Please, Dad, trust me. Okay, I replied calmly. When can you do this? 
considering that today is Tuesday, I will apply tomorrow, do some favors, and by Friday it will be delivered to the time and place you specified. Are you heading home? He asked. Yes, but I think I'll be on my best behavior for the next two days. Lately I've noticed that she doesn't pay much attention to me. She doesn't seem to notice anything at all. Just as I was about to leave, she suddenly stood up and put her hand on my shoulder. Dad, don't do anything stupid. Confused, I asked what I could do wrong. I assured her that I had no intention of doing anything stupid. But I didn't know that right after I got out of the car, she called her friend, who turned out to be one of the most successful lawyers in the state. Dave, keep your schedule open, she said. I may need your help soon. I was right, because she didn't notice anything unusual. Taking advantage of a short break between assignments, I decided to visit my youngest son, although he was originally sitting at the back, but when he heard the sound of the bell, he came out with a smile. Hi dad, how are you? He greeted me, but before I could answer, he continued, I already know, Junior and Mel called me last night. I had a feeling you'd come by, so how can I help you? With his body decorated with tattoos and piercings, he has always been my adventurer child, but surprisingly, he has never been in trouble in his entire life. He acquired his mother's mischievous sense of humor and my firm moral compass. Although he had the freedom to choose any specialty in college, he decided to capitalize on his passion for firearms by turning it into a highly profitable enterprise. As with my other children, I provided him with the necessary funds to set up a business. He became a respected gunsmith and gained devoted fans akin to a cult. His specialty was the customization and improvement of Special Forces weapons, which allowed sniper rifles to reach an impressive range of 350 yards. With a quarter, you could hide the first three shots, and the next three with a dime. With a sure grip, it was possible to achieve an accurate hit. This man took over all the responsibilities in the three major cities nearby, and also did a significant amount of work for the local SBO and the FBI. He also ran a very profitable gun store and supplied police equipment. Thanks to their efforts, my family and I had an ample supply of firearms, and we often held joint shootings on my vast 20-acre rural property, which we turned into our personal shooting range. As he carefully took aim at his collection of weapons, I couldn't stop wondering what an unexpected turn his life had taken. I had no idea that he was married. Meanwhile, his partner was an incredibly talented person, the owner of a famous tattoo parlor, and her work often adorned the pages of magazines. As soon as I saw her, the connection between us was instantaneous. There was something about her that aroused my sincere admiration and sympathy. While we were spending time together, he showed me a few new items from time to time, intrigued me with the possibility of using them in the future. As I was driving home, my thoughts were interrupted by a call from my youngest daughter, a nurse practitioner who was also a partner in the office. Her worried voice asked, Dad, are you all right? Do you need anything? You're not planning on doing anything stupid, are you? I chuckled, imagining her furrowed brows and reading glasses sliding down her nose during a phone conversation. Don't worry, my love. Do you really think that I could make a mistake and miss the appearance of our new grandson? Not for the world. I sighed, considering the idea of taking a couple of sleeping pills. I've been plagued by sleepless nights lately. After my mother died, she wrote me a prescription to help me cope with insomnia caused by grief. It was easy to get them, and they turned out to be incredibly effective. Over time, I became more and more dependent on them. During my time working for a company I doubted, I experienced significant stress. My doctor, aware of the situation, often prescribed medications for only a week, occasionally providing me with samples. After a stern warning, she assured me that she would contact the pharmacy and make sure that my prescription was fulfilled. It was Thursday evening, and my wife and I were enjoying a delicious dinner, having a pleasant conversation. If I hadn't known about the real state of affairs, it would have been difficult for me to comprehend her action. 
To brighten up the evening I opened a bottle of wine from a nearby vineyard, which I knew held a special place in her heart. After lunch I took it out. When we were relaxing after the meal I handed her a glass. Knowing my aversion to wine she wasn't surprised when I chose beer. When her glass was empty, I refilled it and got myself another beer. Halfway through the second glass, she nodded. Carefully, I took the glass from her hands. You look tired, my dear. Why not lean back on the couch and relax? I'll turn on the music and clean up the kitchen. In response, she muttered something that sounded like, thank you, after which she sank into a light snore. After tidying up the kitchen and making two phone calls, the content of the first conversation was reduced to now. The second call, however, lasted a little longer. It began with a greeting to Sandy, followed by a question about her well-being. Sandy replied that she was fine. Then the conversation turned to Barry and whether he had already found a job. I told Sandy that maybe I had a potential opportunity for him. I explained that I was going to meet someone at the workplace to assess their skills during the second shift. I invited Sandy and Barry to join me and come with me, as they needed a night operations manager. Mentioning that the salary is about 40000 I asked if he would be interested in it. Encouraged, Sandy promised that Barry would be ready within the next 30 minutes. I mentally reminded myself that I needed to get rid of the phone as soon as possible and went outside to wait. I had a mid-90s GMC truck that was rarely used. It was accompanied by a flimsy awning which I immediately took off. After all, what's the point of having a truck if you can't use it to transport goods? But on the same day, I decided to install it back. A few minutes later, Barry came up to me. He expressed his gratitude for my help and told me how much he admired my wife and me. No problem, Barry. That's what neighbors are for. I replied. Before we leave, could you check if I've installed the bolts on this thing correctly? My car is currently in a repair shop, and my wife categorically does not want me to use her car. I would not like any trouble to happen on the road. To make sure everything was securely fastened, I carefully examined and adjusted the trunk lid. When my neighbor bent down to check the bolts, I suddenly stunned him with a stun gun. He shuddered, sighed, and quickly lost consciousness. Taking advantage of the situation, I carefully got him into the car, closed the back door and trunk, and got out of the car. After driving for about five minutes, I turned into a secluded corner. Just when he regained consciousness, I used the stun gun again, taking advantage of the opportunity to handcuff his hands and secure his legs with shackles. I got to our training ground, setting off on a journey that lasted about 30 minutes. Along the way, I came across a deserted dirt road that looked more like a lonely goat trail than a normal route. Perhaps my speed was excessive, which caused me to experience a series of bumps and bumps, possibly spurred on by my anger. Arriving at the place, I unlocked the gate and entered the territory. But when I closed the gate again, I heard him screaming and stomping from inside. This made me remind myself to bring a gag with me when I returned. Upon entering the landfill, I couldn't help but pay attention to the roughness of the road, which I had never appreciated before. It was a harsh realization brought on by my uncharacteristically fast driving. As soon as I opened the back door, he let out a piercing scream. I quickly grabbed the straps of his legs and pulled him out forcefully, causing a loud thud when he hit the ground. His mouth opened, presumably to protest, but I quickly forced him to. He was instantly silent. Listen here, you despicable person. I said sternly. I'm going to let you go, but you will obey my instructions implicitly. You will go to that bench and sit firmly on it. Don't move. Do not utter a single word until ordered otherwise. Is everything clear to you? He pressed the barrel to his mouth and nodded with all his might. I wasn't sure, but it felt like I'd knocked out a tooth when I finally pulled it out. However, he wouldn't complain even if I did. His lack of balance and my dwindling patience forced me to push him forward, occasionally resorting to a well-aimed kick to the back of his body. Along with physical support, I also offered verbal motivation. It is important to note that this revolver belonged to the judge and was loaded with four cartridges for a 10-gauge shotgun, which makes it comparable in size. This object, 
slightly larger than a cube, is capable of causing enormous pain when hit accurately. But it is unlikely to be fatal. But if I discharge its contents into you without even touching vital areas, you will start bleeding profusely. Barry, do you understand the gravity of the situation? Tears were rolling down his face, but he nodded in agreement. Leading him to the nearest bench, I tied him tightly with sturdy 36-inch zippers, depriving him of mobility. His attempts to scream were quickly stopped when I inserted and tightened the gag borrowed from my sister-in-law. As a side venture to her tattoo business, she also offered various adult products for sale. This unconventional combination has caused a lot of fascinating discussions during family dinners. Every few months, my daughters, daughters-in-law, and selected friends gathered together to explore new products and give pleasure to their partners. I settled into a camp chair, sitting right in front of him. The moonlight illuminated the faint streaks of tears on her face. Barry, do you understand the purpose of our presence here? I asked. He shook his head in response, showing uncertainty. Come on, Barry. I know you're smarter than that. Barry, let's think about what could motivate a kind-hearted person like me to do such things. We have to get into the depths of our thoughts. It is very important to recognize that such behavior can cause serious emotional trauma to other people. What disturbing events can throw a person off balance? The tragic loss of a child, unemployment, or a feeling of abandonment, perhaps. I understand the severity of these experiences. But what about the torment caused by infidelity? Countless men are pushed to the limit when faced with the betrayal of their spouse. Revenge becomes a tempting path that leads to pain and grief for all parties involved. The consequences lead to even more unpleasant consequences. Divorce, the unfortunate loss of children, and increasing ugliness. Am I not right in my assumptions, Barry? I couldn't help but laugh at the lack of comments. Oops, my mistake. Let me help you. I quickly removed the gag, inadvertently causing him a small head injury. Now we can communicate like reasonable people. Now it's your turn, Barry. I've been dominating the conversation for too long, haven't I? Speak up, you despicable man! I shouted at him, overwhelmed with disappointment. Tears streamed down his face as he stuttered. I'm sorry. She came up to me and... A hollow slap echoed through the night. Does it matter who approached whom? Has this worsened her marital status? Has it worsened yours? Any of you had the opportunity to make the right choice and leave. But you both chose not to do that, didn't you? Do you really think that the suffering I'm putting you through is worth having an affair with elderly married woman? He was sobbing incoherently. I shone the flashlight into his eyes. That's what got you hooked, Barry. This is a fully working flashlight with a built-in immobilizer. You just press down and the teeth slide out and immobilize. It causes a lot of pain, so I've heard. It's a gift from my youngest son. I got to my feet and walked around him examining his slings. Stopping in front of him, I reached for my bag, which was lying on the seat of the truck. I've brought toys for us, Barry, I announced with anticipation. It's going to be an exciting sight, don't you think? Excitedly, I opened a pair of sturdy scissors and playfully threw them in his direction. But his reaction was panic-stricken when I started pulling off his pants. Sensing his concern, I reminded him of the need to remain motionless in order to avoid accidents. I took off my pants and looked at him in disappointment. Barry, this is not what I expected. I had high hopes. It's amazing that this little thing causes you such suffering. By the way, did you know that my eldest daughter owns a private detective agency? Very impressive, I must say. Collecting a pile of documents, I couldn't help but shake my head in disbelief. Barry, Barry, Mrs. Oliver must be 60 years old or more. And Mrs. Grant, she is no more than 25 years old. And yet she easily weighs more than 250 pounds. Of course, you can't take that much away from her, can you? And finally... I recall that you mentioned your contempt for Mrs. Jeffries. It's nice to see that you've overcome your prejudices. Is her husband very tall, about six foot five? I imagine he weighs about 300 pounds. 
I must admit, I expected the prison guards to be more physically prepared. You certainly led an active life in this area, didn't you? Do you have anything left for your wonderful wife? You remember her, right? The one who gave you two beautiful children? Who works overtime to support you? I can only imagine how painful it will be for her to see these photos. He grimaced and let out a groan. I gently stroked his head, trying to calm him down. I will definitely provide her with emotional support during this difficult time. I am ready to provide her and the children with any help. Moreover, if they lose their home, I can even offer them to stay with me. It is worth mentioning that Mrs. Oliver's son holds the prominent position of Vice President of Mortgage Loans at your bank. It's interesting that you didn't get along at school, if I remember correctly. Anyway, I will comfort her to the best of my ability, hoping that she will appreciate it. Despite the fact that I am getting old, I am grateful that a warm fire is still burning in my stove. Since I sincerely love children, this will be a mutually beneficial agreement for both of us. I might even consider adopting them. Do you mind? He began to resist less. I lightly patted his cheeks a few times and then I gave him a little slap. He shuddered. Okay, I was afraid you'd fall asleep. Don't get too comfortable because we have a lot of things ahead of us. Barry, I'll give you a few options. Take your time, think about them carefully. As soon as I'm done, I'll give you a minute to make a decision. But Barry, I'm counting on you to make a decision before we hit the road, okay? Good. Rummaging in the bag, I pulled out an object resembling pliers, with handles and three prongs on the front. Do you want to guess what kind of object it is? This is none other than a bull bander head, a device used for castration. Let me demonstrate its use. I got hold of a rubber band half an inch wide and only about an inch in circumference and positioned it accordingly. After applying the tape to the three prongs, I deftly squeezed the handles, as a result of which the prongs instantly pushed the tape about four inches apart. Let me explain the process. First, you take hold of the bull's scrotum and carefully place the device on it. As soon as the handle is released, the tape is tightly fixed around the scrotum, causing severe initial pain. But after about an hour, this place will go numb. Within three days, the testicles stop functioning. Then, within one and a half to two weeks, the scrotum naturally disappears. This method is fast, relatively painless, and does not require any invasive procedures. Interestingly, my youngest daughter's husband turned out to be a co-owner of a butcher shop with her father. The genuine horror in his eyes was quite obvious. My goal was to scare him, not castrate him. I carefully took a bottle of pills in my hand. Like the previous one, this bottle was given to me by my youngest daughter. Surprisingly, these pills were intended for animals, in particular for males from the shelter, who are considered attractive. One pill makes them impotent for a week, two tablets extend the validity period to about a month, and three or more tablets lead to irreversible consequences. After calculating your weight, I came to the conclusion that you will need six pills. When I shared this information, tears began to flow uncontrollably. It's a tattoo machine. Are these the sketches? Just by placing them in front of you I can draw lines. Do you need blue or black ink? In the light of the truck's headlights, he could see the drawings clearly. I chose one, a carefully crafted life-size image of a male genital organ. As unusual as it may sound, this is my personal favorite. It stretches down your cheek, and the tip reaches the edge of your lips. In addition, I have another drawing with an inscription that will be applied to your forehead. Do you think it will increase your popularity among women? I leaned back in my chair and sighed heavily. Well, Barry, it's time to make a choice. If you don't, I'll probably do the whole assignment. Oh, I almost forgot about it. I gathered even more papers in my hands. My eldest son works as a lawyer, and these documents relate to cases involving alienated attachment, which is legally recognized in our state. There's one for me, one for Mr. Jeffries, and one for Mr. Grant. Despite the fact that Mrs. Oliver is a widow, she is listed as a witness. You can choose one if you want. In the meantime, I'm going to have a beer while you're thinking.
I would suggest it to you, but I prefer that you have a clear mind. I'll be back soon, and it's in your best interest to give me an answer. I walked away, disappearing into obscurity, eventually found a log and immersed myself in the sounds of the night. An owl hooted nearby, and coyotes howled from the far ridge. On the damp ground, a harmonious chorus of tree frogs could be heard in the dark, creating a calm atmosphere. When I returned, I found him lying on his back, seemingly in distress. I shook him vigorously. Barry, make a decision. I have a few personal favorites in mind. I hope you'll give up this option, allowing me to experience some entertainment. He begged tirelessly. I let out a yawn. Time is ticking, Barry. I will enjoy it, although you may not like it so much. I grabbed the bandage. I guess it won't hurt too much. Let me know if you change your mind, okay? Curious to see this? Well, maybe it's in everyone's best interest. I took a leather mask out of my bag and fixed it tightly on his head, leaving only his nose exposed. I replaced the castrating tape with a strong elastic band. I witnessed his high-pitched scream, an alarming sound, but not one that could have long-term consequences if it were eliminated within 24 hours. Taking out a bottle of pills, I found that I was holding estrogen pills in my hands, the remnants of what my future ex-wife was trying to make her skin look younger with hormone replacement therapy. The potential side effects of these pills were relatively mild, causing temporary elevated mood swings. Picking up a bottle of water, I carefully placed five pills in the palm of my hand. Carefully unbuttoning the mask, I tightly clamped his nostrils. When he tried to scream, I quickly inserted the pills and forcefully pushed the water bottle down his throat. He struggled, coughed, and eventually managed to swallow. Lost in my own thoughts, I suddenly heard a voice from the darkness. That's enough, Dad. I think he understood everything. We will deal with this situation on our own. Surprisingly, all four of my children came into this world accompanied by their son-in-law and daughter-in-law. How did you know? I asked, taken aback. Mel chuckled. You're incredibly easy to read. There were a couple of people looking out for you from the very beginning. I wanted to step in earlier, but most people thought you deserved some fun. Your nature is very unnerving. It would be better if you returned home as you have other things to do. Our concern is the same. Reluctantly, I submitted to their wisdom and left. After meeting Barry, I immediately called Sandy and explained that I couldn't delay any longer and had to leave. Although I had a preliminary meeting, I arrived late and had to take my leave. Sandy didn't know anything about his whereabouts. It took four hours before he was escorted home by the police. His story of how he was forcibly abducted, robbed, attacked, and abandoned on the side of the road appeared gradually. As the events unfolded, the police became more and more convinced that the wronged husband or possibly a group of spouses was guilty. My weak alibi was readily accepted by the authorities, since my wife was incapacitated and could not tell the exact time of my return. The next morning, her piercing scream as she tried to take a shower will forever remain in my memory. My wife's pubic hair was completely shaved off, revealing an intricate tattoo that boldly read, Barry's Whore on her smooth bump. But this tattoo was not permanent, but rather temporary, created by tattooists using experimental ink. It was specially designed for those who did not dare to get a real tattoo. If they had changed their mind, the ink would have come off easily without causing any harm. My wife was above suspicion in this matter. Several passers-by noticed her and the rest of her family enjoying a meal at a nearby diner. Presumably it could be a fellow artist who was moving and needed additional funds, although this is just a guess. When I was preparing to leave for a short vacation, she suddenly let out a piercing scream, leaving photos and a divorce agreement on the dining table without the right to divorce. There was a note attached to these things, saying that I would help her find an apartment and pay her expenses for three months while she was looking for a job. After the widely publicized divorce, I made the decision to leave her feeling abandoned and lonely. 
She agreed to the terms, moved to another area of the city and eventually found love with a man four years younger than her. Interestingly, it seems that a relationship with a man older than her age did not suit her. After the wedding, they quickly moved to Alaska. I couldn't help but grin when I found out that she passionately despised the cold climate. I never asked about the reasons for her infidelity. In fact, I chose to cut all ties and never spoke to her again. All necessary legal issues were handled by our lawyers. All the neighbors were surprised when photos began to appear in different mailboxes. Sandy finally kicked Barry out, and he left without revealing his destination, right in front of Mr. Jeffries and Mr. Grant. When everything calmed down, I turned to Mel and asked for help finding Barry to file for divorce and establish alimony. There were rumors that he was having a hard time meeting his financial obligations and leading a respectable lifestyle, but as long as he paid properly, no one seemed to mind. Unofficially, I took on the role of another parent for Sandy, treating her like my own child. She found solace in my support, as I sincerely helped her through difficult times. Understanding her situation, I contacted Mr. Oliver and successfully renegotiated the terms of her mortgage. Seeing his deep sympathy, I was touched by his generosity. A year later, during their honeymoon, I took over the care of the boys, as Mr. Oliver's wedding gift was the full repayment of her house bill. Time passed, and two years later a new brother or sister appeared in the boys' lives. Unexpectedly, both Mr. Jeffries and Mr. Grant divorced their wives. Mrs. Jeffries moved to another area of the city and spent the next three years trying to rebuild a broken relationship. After a long-awaited conversation, he managed to convince her to return to the area, but their marital status remained unchanged, as they had not yet remarried. It became obvious that Mrs. Grant had nowhere to call because she was out of state. My heart sank when I saw her walking down the road, clutching a lonely suitcase in her hands and tears streaming down her face. Feeling responsible, I decided to step in and offered her a ride home. I led her into an empty bedroom, giving her temporary shelter. Over time, Mrs. Grant gradually joined my household, taking responsibility for its cleanliness and organization. Unexpectedly, it turned out that she has remarkable business skills, Therefore, she also took on the role of managing our home office. In an effort to improve my overall well-being, I purchased a gym membership for both of us. While I was focusing on lifting weights, Mrs. Grant began the journey of transformation by losing over a hundred pounds of weight. She exuded a captivating charm, attracting a swarm of men to her until she firmly stated that she was satisfied with her current partner. The one she had was more than fine with her. After dropping the first 50 kilograms, she startled me one night by bouncing vigorously on the bed and interrupting my sleep. I think this phase will pass, she remarked, catching me off guard. It took me a moment to realize that she was completely naked. It was a weight test. I've always longed for this moment, but the fear of the bed's capacity held me back. Now she insisted that I make room for her. I've always been used to sleeping on my right side and this habit has remained unchanged. To my surprise, during Thanksgiving dinner, my partner made an unexpected announcement about our plans to start a family. This news amused my children a lot, who found it very funny. At first, I tried to dissuade her from this decision, but she insisted that I was already too late to express my concerns. To do the right thing, I decided to marry her. As a result, all four of my children had long conversations with her about my firm beliefs in loyalty and devotion. It seems that these conversations could upset her. As it turned out, her own husband behaved unfaithfully, and she embarked on this path solely as an act of revenge. Unfortunately, my involvement inadvertently provided him with evidence of her actions. She declined the invitation. Just a few days before our daughter was born, my fifth grandson was born. When my 58th birthday was only 10 days away, it dawned on me that when our daughter graduated from college, I would be 80 years old. Recently, the kids threw a Halloween party and insisted that we attend it. The theme was terrible, and I decided to dress up in a fake axe and a hockey mask. Meanwhile, 
my stunning wife took on the role of Elvira, easily embodying her image. Her attractiveness was the only thing that really scared me. But my daughter-in-law, a talented tattoo artist, chose a unique outfit, a football suit and a briefcase in her hands. The other children were filled with curiosity. They were eager to find out who this mysterious girl was. I am my father-in-law, she said, which sent chills down the children's backs. With a tremor in her voice, she confessed, he's the scariest person I've ever come across. Despite her formidable statement, she triumphantly took first place and received the first prize for her unusual costume. From time to time, we encounter these unexpected breaks in the routine of life. They resemble a terrible dream from which you want to escape. But sometimes, when we wake up, we find that the nightmare was actually a grim reality. Dexter, I need to talk to you about something. I looked at my spouse, a life partner for more than ten years. A light breeze ruffled a strand of her hair, freeing it from the false tatep a unique car roof with removable panels, and the remaining curls fell in graceful waves. She possessed an inner beauty that radiated from the depths of her soul. Her hair was ablaze with a bright flame, scattering over her face in fiery waves. They enveloped her in a mesmerizing aura, emphasizing the contours of her flawless features. The pale green sundress clung to her body perfectly, emphasizing her attractiveness, her appearance possessed an unearthly beauty, captivating the hearts of women and igniting the passion of men. On her porcelain skin, so clean and delicate, there were a few scattered freckles that danced on her nose. Their number inevitably increased, while she basked in the sun's embrace and disappeared after a few fleeting hours, unless illuminated by ultraviolet rays. There was an expression of concern in her large brown eyes, and her lips, painted a bright red shade, were tightly compressed. Can it wait five minutes? I asked, trying to hear the howling of the wind and the cacophony of exhaust noise. She nodded in agreement. The deafening roar of our open-roofed Trans Am made conversation almost impossible. Deep down, I was looking forward to the upcoming discussion, knowing what she wanted to talk about. But to tell the truth, I was not interested in it but I knew I was going to have to face it, so I gritted my teeth and got ready. Arriving at the cottage, we thought about the decision we made two years ago when we bought this house on the lake shore. Here we spent the weekend, allowing ourselves to recuperate in a serene environment. This weekend, our eight-year-old twins, Kia and Mia, spent time with my parents, giving us a rare opportunity to have some privacy. Feeling the need for such a break, we unloaded the car, brought food and things into the salon, and then put them in their places. I opened two bottles of cold beer and headed for the covered back porch that ran the length of the house. In this quiet place there was a spacious hammock, which beckoned to lie down and relax. I was relaxing peacefully, enjoying the melodious sounds of boats sailing on a calm lake. Suddenly, Kathleen appeared from the room took her beer and snuggled down next to me. While I was gently stroking her hair, she bent down and pressed her cheek against my chest, making a contented purr. Her gaze of those amazingly huge eyes rested on me. Breaking the silence, she said, Dex, Derek Harper has returned to our city. Now he holds the position of a salesman at my workplace. Realizing this information, I calmly replied, Yes, I already knew. Her eyes moved curiously to my face. Did you know? You never talked about it, she remarked. After inquiring about my silence, she asked, What did you want me to say? I thought if you knew, you'd warn me to stay away from him. Your ex-fiancé suddenly showed up after twelve years, and you expect me to react? I thought to myself, Okay, stay away from him, cat. Are you upset? she asked, as if she didn't know what to do. Do I have a good reason to be upset? I replied. I had lunch with him, she confessed. I'm aware, I replied, sensing her concern again. Did you know, but decided not to tell me? She asked. For what purpose? I asked her a question, knowing full well that I would not approve of it. 
I have no power over you, my feline companion. You're free to have dinner with whomever you want. But I saw that my answer did not meet her expectations. What do you mean? This made her increasingly annoyed. He invited me to meet him at the rhinoceros on Friday evening after our working hours were over. Yes, I'm aware, I confirmed. What's the matter with you, Dex? She looked visibly upset, her graceful chest heaving with rapid breathing. How did you find out about all this? In the restaurant behind you, Penny was sitting in the booth next to yours. I've already mentioned that Penny is my personal assistant, I said. Kathleen's face instantly turned red, indicating her discomfort. Curious, she asked. What did she tell you? Do you suspect that she was dishonest? Kathleen hesitated for a moment before replying. No, I don't believe she would cheat on you. Gradually, her anxiety subsided. While expressing my dissatisfaction, I noticed, you didn't reject his request as decisively as I had hoped. In search of clarification, I asked, Kathleen, will you agree to go the next time he asks? Firmly denying my concerns, she replied, no, absolutely not. Carefully placing my fingers under her pointed chin, I tilted her head up so that she met my gaze. Kathleen, please don't lie to me, I begged. We have always been honest with each other when it comes to important issues. She looked away for a moment before meeting my eyes again. I don't believe that's true, Dex, she said, a note of temptation in her voice. I need your help. I want you to fight for me, Dex. After assuring her, I replied, I will support you, but I will not fight for your affection, Cat. I suspect you can find pleasure in drama, but that's not something I'm willing to participate in. We are married, which means there should be no rivalry. Surprised, she asked, Rivalry? It depends on you. It's you who needs to fight. I begged, look at me, cat. Think about what you own. Think about what you have in your own home. Think about the people who are looking forward to your arrival at your parents' house. That's what you're aiming for, she said mockingly, and drops of tears rolled down her cheeks. That's what makes it so difficult, she admitted. I am fully aware of what I possess, and I understand what temptations I should not succumb to. And yet I can't resist the temptation, she interjected. Indeed, I know that I should resist temptation. I love you, Dex. I love our life together. I cherish my children and every aspect of my existence. You are an extraordinary lover and the most romantic man I have ever met. You have qualities that I deeply admire, attentiveness, kindness, and care. I've always dreamed of a man like you. So I have to ask, Cat, why are you attracted to him? She answered in a whisper. I was just thinking about what my life would be like if I married him. I reminded her that she was engaged to him and found him in an intimate setting with the girl who was supposed to be her bridesmaid. That's exactly what she shared with me. He's a manipulator, Cat. It is likely that you will eventually get divorced after experiencing severe pain and emotional shock, I explained. What attracts you to him? She replied, We've never had physical intimacy. I want to share one thing with you. When we first met, I was inexperienced in this aspect of my life. It makes me think about what might have happened if I had had an intimate relationship with someone else. Have you ever thought about it? Well, I have to admit, I understand what you're getting at. I'm curious to get into a physical relationship with Jennifer Thomas. I don't like the expression you used. I got angry. It seems obvious, Cat, that he doesn't have much respect for cheaters. I think so, don't I? She asked. Well, it looks like he's trying to stalk you, knowing full well that you're married, have two little daughters and a husband, I replied. I suppose it labels him as a man who leads a promiscuous sex life. But Kathleen, what does it say about you that you don't seem to care? I care, she protested. Confused, I asked, taking a deep breath, I confessed. I'm expressing my doubts that I really understand who my wife is. I thought you loved me and I was sure of your honesty. I never thought that you would take such a huge risk, hurting me, our daughters, parents and our whole family. 
It's terrible to find out that everything I believed in has collapsed. And now you expect me to fight for you? Tears were streaming down her face, and she couldn't hold back her sobs anymore. I hugged her tightly, giving her the opportunity to vent all her emotions. With red, swollen eyes, she looked at me and asked, What should we do now? I replied, I don't know what you're going to do next, but as for us, I'm not sure that this we still exists. I have a clear plan, I said confidently. Curiously, she asked, and what is it? Without hesitation, I answered, I'm going to make my safety a priority. In addition, I will ensure the protection of our daughters and our entire family. She asked in disbelief, what do you mean? I could feel the fear in her trembling voice. Calming down, I explained. In case you decide to meet this disgusting man for dinner or a drink, I have taken the necessary precautions. Everything is prepared accordingly. Now she asked anxiously, Are you threatening me? Holding her tightly, I calmed her down. Not at all, I'm just expressing my determination and intentions. You made the first mistake of not telling me that he was back in town. Another mistake was made when you talked to him without telling me about it. The third mistake occurred when you secretly met with him at lunch. Now you deserve a little credit for finally telling me about it. But I don't trust you anymore, Kat. How can I continue to be married to you? Please enlighten me. Are you thinking of divorcing me? She was shocked. What do you think will happen, Dexter? I didn't do anything wrong. No, I did, I argued. You are currently undermining my ability to trust you. Will you be able to establish a relationship after the divorce? What is it? She asked. Probably not, I replied. I understand that the justice system often approves of the betrayal of those who care about you, but I doubt that you will find satisfaction in this. If you don't come to your senses, you'll always be remembered as another unfaithful wife. The people you value highly, the ones you cherish, will know about it. Cat. I believe that you are inherently good, and I do not believe that you will find inner peace by living with this knowledge. Every time you look in the mirror when your eyes meet the eyes of the women around you, whether it's your parents or your sister, you witness a reflection of your true self and their perception of you. I don't believe that you are capable of this. You're going to hurt me a lot, and to tell you the truth, you've already hurt me but I will overcome these difficulties anyway. Countless people have overcome similar situations and found happiness. I will find my own way. Disappointment overwhelmed her, and a slight moan escaped her lips. Divorce is not what I want, Dex. Can't you just let me do one thing? Can't you give me the opportunity to deal with this on my own? Please help me get these thoughts out of my head and grant me forgiveness. I confessed to my insecurity when I said, I have no idea. Although I'm not sure I can pleasantly surprise myself. I doubt my ability to do this, but I am able to forgive Kathleen, the woman I married and loved deeply for almost everything. Perhaps I can find the strength to forgive a compromising situation, even if it is related to the fact that you were intoxicated at a party where everyone was engaged in intimate activities and you were carried away by the moment. Although it won't be easy, I believe I can forgive something like this. After all, we all make mistakes, and you've always forgiven me for mine. I can ignore your mistakes and forgive you, but what is happening now is completely different. It feels like this is intentional and premeditated, an obvious act of betrayal and treason. That cat six months ago who made a mistake but still loved me, I was able to forgive. My love for you is so strong that goosebumps run down my spine. But with you, I'm not sure I'll ever be able to forgive your past actions. Now it seems extremely unlikely. You are still to some extent a stranger to me. Overwhelmed with emotion, she struggled to her feet and walked towards the cottage with tears in her eyes. I plunged into a state of maximum comfort, allowing myself to close my eyes and relax. Slowly but surely, drowsiness took hold of me, and when I finally woke up from it, darkness fell. Reflections of light from the far shore danced on the lake, and a lone fishing boat was rocking 50 meters from our house. Looking around, 
I saw a cat sitting on a chair a meter and a half away from me. She was wrapped in a plaid, tears were rolling down her face, and she was watching me intently. Sensing my awakening, she spoke softly, her voice heavy with emotion. Dexter, I want you to know that I haven't changed. I'm still the same as I was six months ago, she said with conviction. How can you say that I've changed and still not love me anymore? I explained that I had never made such a statement. I told her that if she was the same person she was six months ago, then I never really understood her. I asked her if she had ever thought about being intimate with anyone other than me six months ago, to which she replied with an unequivocal, no. She expressed her deep love for me. I came to the conclusion that she had really changed. Kathleen begged me to listen to her, assuring me that we could get out of this situation. I agreed to listen to her and said, okay, speak up, I'm listening. She confessed, you're the only person I've ever been intimate with and I've never wanted anyone else. You have always satisfied all my needs and desires. I cherish being your wife and the mother of our daughters. I sincerely admire every aspect of our life together. But I can't help but think about what it would be like to be intimate with someone else. If you'd let me do that, it would have given me a definitive answer. All my doubts and insecurities would disappear. Please believe in my love for you, Dex. I am. I don't think so, I replied causing another wave of sobs and tears. Her voice trembled as she exclaimed, How can you say that? Dexter, I love you with all my heart. You mean everything to me. I believe that we can solve this problem together by talking openly. Wouldn't you rather have that than what I'm hiding from you? I trust you enough to be honest, to admit it. Doesn't that mean anything to you? I was silent, letting the gravity of the moment drag on only occasionally interrupting her sniffling. While I was thinking about the situation, my mind wandered. I finally felt prepared. Good, I admitted. The fact that you came to me with this question is important. If you'd been hiding it, we wouldn't have had a chance. You should have been honest with me from the beginning. I appreciate you talking to me, and I'll give you an example. Let me ask you something. Imagine that I confess my deep love for Mia and Kia. Our young neighbor Melinda lives opposite our house. Despite this, you believe in my affection for our daughters. After a decade, a shocking discovery is discovered. There is a secret room in the basement. It is in this room that Melinda comes, and together we subject Mia and Kia to unthinkable torments. I try to justify my actions by claiming that my love for them is the driving force, and I assure you that the torture will stop in just two weeks when Melinda leaves. Startled by this statement, she hisses, Love does not involve hurting those you care about. With a heavy heart, I answer, But it's you I'm torturing. You may not resort to waterboards, holes, or screw driving, but your methods are no less painful. You know how to draw a beautiful facade, but inside you mentally torment the person you claim to love. If that's how you understand love, then I never want to be on the side of your hatred. She practically screamed, emphasizing that she never intended to hurt me. Can't you see that this situation is no less painful for her? She believed that she could trust me, find support and understanding from me, and not be burdened with guilt. Don't you understand that I'm already burdened with enough illnesses? You don't need to burden me with all this. Cat, what were you hoping to hear or do from me? I asked. If you let me know what you want, I'll determine if I can do it. She replied, Dex, I've been waiting for your understanding and support. If you loved me as deeply as I love you, you would show patience and affection and not be harsh and critical. Can't you understand? I need to immerse myself in my emotions. If you really cared about me, you would support me as I make my way through these uncertainties, believing that my love will eventually lead me to you. I was wondering if you doubt my love for you, if you doubt that I will come back. Can't you just be by my side and let me deal with my emotions? I was confused by your words, in which you ask me to wait patiently while you communicate with someone disrespectful. Was I supposed to support you in this? Am I supposed to understand this? Where did this concept come from? It's like outdated pop psychology. 
We went to psychology classes with Sandra. The teacher's words made me think, Sandra? I was amazed. Is this really the same Sandra who has gone through several marriages? Is this really the same Sandra who lives in a bad apartment, estranged from her family because they disapprove of her choice? Has she really become your inspiration, Cat? No wonder you have your own problems. I'm scared because of my difficult marriage, she replied. I gathered my thoughts for a moment before saying the words I might regret in the future. That's the plan, Cat. I'm giving you the upcoming weekend to gather your thoughts. As far as I know, you haven't taken any irreversible action yet. As soon as we get home, the countdown will start. You have a week to make a decision about our marriage. If you happen to talk to Derek Harper, be sure to give him your opinion. But if you decide to meet him for lunch, our relationship is over. The same goes for meetings with him over drinks or outside of work. Don't forget to activate the GPS on your phone. If you end up where you shouldn't be, our relationship is over. And if you plan to work late, I urge you to contact me immediately and provide an explanation about your current work situation and the people you work with. If it's about Derek Harper, you're going to have to distance yourself from that environment. You should tell your boss that you are refusing to work with Derek Harper because of his inappropriate advances towards you. In addition, it is necessary that you call Sandra while I'm around and clearly express your desire to sever all ties and stop further communication with her. This conversation should take place before we finish our weekend here. Upon returning home, we will actively seek help from both a marriage counselor and a personal counselor, attending sessions together to sort out and improve our relationship. You will attend personal counseling sessions alone. If you don't fulfill at least one of these requirements, our relationship will end. I am ready to help and support you in any efforts aimed at preserving our marriage, but I will not support or help actions aimed at its destruction. You need to take the time to think about all this. If you decide not to participate in any of these steps, all you have to do is say one word. No. Her reaction was as if she saw a completely different person. Without giving her a chance to answer, I quickly got up from my seat and entered the house, leaving her on the porch. After I finished taking a shower, she stayed in the room. Climbing into bed, I unexpectedly fell asleep without difficulty. Not knowing when she joined me, I woke up to find her snuggled up against my back, not taking off her clothes at all. She whispered softly in my ear, Yes, Dexter, I want to remain your wife. I am deeply sorry for the pain I have caused you, and I am ready to do anything to make amends. I spent countless hours thinking, unable to sleep. I am ready to do anything to save our marriage. I will do my best not to do anything that could endanger our relationship or our family. I completely lost the desire to participate in any harmful behavior. I do not know what came over me, but I intend to seek professional help from a psychologist. Please let me know what I can do to fix it. I confessed my love to you, and I sincerely understand that. I will never communicate with him again. I turned to her and said, I'm glad to hear that, cat. This is a positive first step, but I must admit that from the very beginning, this situation did not please me. I think it bothers you that you don't even think about it. I don't understand your motives, and I can't figure out the situation. I think it will be useful to conduct an investigation and try to resolve this issue. Why do you think there's something wrong with me, Dexter? What is it? She asked. I'm not going to get into an argument or provoke your anger. Do you know that many people marry freely and live a full life? I don't know the source of your information, I told her. That's a lie. I did a little research when I discovered your addiction and it's just unfounded. The truth remains unknown to anyone. I am not sure about the number of people who get into such situations. Although some people may find satisfaction, I know that I am not personally one of them. Each of us has the right to make choices based on our values and limitations. Although this may suit some people, it does not match my beliefs. I want to make it clear that I do not intend to adhere to this lifestyle. Besides, I believe that only a small minority of people actually live this way. Are you sure about this? She asked. 
I brushed off the opinions of Sarah and the MX teacher, calling them unreliable sources. I am not particularly concerned about the prevalence of open marriages around the world. What really worries me is the upcoming divorces. How likely is it that our own marriage will stand the test of time? Not really, she murmured softly. I assured her that I was not the kind of person who could stand it. The thought of humiliation and jealousy is not something I like. The idea of my wife having an intimate relationship with another man is disgusting to me. I have no interest in it, and it doesn't wake me up at all. This situation makes me uneasy. As far as I understand, the only chance for such marriages to last at least a short time is if both people accept it. Personally, I am categorically against it. I admit I didn't think much of it, and now she was in tears. She asked if I wanted to arrange a date for myself with someone attractive, or if it was supposed to be her. I understood what she was getting at, and asked her to stop blaming herself. She spoke harshly about herself, apologizing for the stupid idea, and admitting her lack of foresight. I didn't have any plan, and just the thought of you being with someone else torments me. I didn't think about the consequences, I just... I can't even explain what was going on in my head. The pain is unbearable, Dexter, but I'm grateful that you did what had to be done. If I had allowed myself to continue, it would have been a disaster for us. It would completely destroy me. I understand that now. I would have lost all self-respect, just like you warned me. If you had given in, it would have been a complete disaster. I still have a lot of personal growth ahead of me, don't I? It's okay. I admit my own stupidity in creating this mess. Now I have to have the mind to fix everything. I believe in your abilities, Cat, because you are very perceptive. We all make mistakes sometimes, including me. I apologize for hitting you, even though it seemed necessary at the time. It is clear that she responded by expressing readiness for retaliatory actions. Beware, for I am ready, my dear. Suddenly, four weeks later, I found myself laughing. Well, I'm thinking about buying a motorcycle so you won't have to wait long. She smiled and sighed. I need to make some phone calls, she said. I have to start. She looked at me. When I get back, I plan to study intensively with you. I hope you're ready. Four hours later, I found solace in unconsciousness. From time to time, life gives us such moments of respite. This is akin to a haunting dream, when sometimes we wake up and find that the nightmare is really real. Other times we wake up with a sense of relief, grateful that we escaped from his clutches. Lying here, sweating profusely, I thanked my lucky stars that I had woken up. 